All right, we are at the top of the hour. Welcome everybody and good evening. We are in NetDevOps Live Season 1 Talk 4 and joining us tonight is Stuart Clark. He's one of our NetDevOps evangelists here in DevNet and he'll be sharing with us a discussion on DevOps style configuration management tools for the network using some open source platforms. Uh, as always, we'll be monitoring the question and answer panel throughout the session. So if you do have questions, feel free to drop those into the Q&A and we'll cover them as they go through. The first question is always, where can I get the slides, code sample, resources that are discussed? And all of those resources are already posted up on NetDevOps Live under the webinar resources for this episode. So be sure to check those out. And without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Stuart to take us away. Thanks. Thank you, Hank. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the session today, which is Net, uh, DevOps style configuration management for the network with open source. As Hank mentioned, my name is Stuart Clark. I'm a network automation evangelist here at Cisco DevNet. And we're really excited to share this session with you and show you all the cool things that we've got coming up in this session. So without further ado, let's see what we're gonna be looking at today. So in this session, the first thing we're gonna talk about is what is infrastructure as code and configuration management. The second thing we're gonna move on to is the benefits of configuration management. Then we'll follow that with the recipes, the manifest, the playbook, and all the tools that we're working with today. And then finally, we're gonna do a configuration management example with Ansible, which is really cool. And it will show you how you can automate your entire network build by using Ansible. So kicking off then, what are infrastructure as code and configuration management? Well, that's a really, really great question. Infrastructure of code is the process of managing and provisioning computed data centers through machine readable and definition files. Back in the day, when I started my network career, we stored all of our network configuration innovation devices as just the show run. And we stored these in, in a, a shared file drive or on, with on one server. But as the network grew, as people came in the team and people left the team, the templates never really got updated. People had their own individual copies of these things. And when you came to replace something, you often find that uh, recent changes had been missed, things hadn't been up to date, and there had to be a better way to get around this. And so we started to look at towards infrastructure as code. And so some of the main principles of infrastructure of code Instead of storing the running configurations, like I mentioned before, we store the configurations in a source control, not on a random server or on somebody's desktop or on a flash pen that somebody always forgets. And we store this as machine readable formats like YAML, JSON, XML. So we can use these in our aut automation process. And we treat the uh, control systems, such as GitHub as the single source of truth. And what we do with that single source of truth is we use it for all the development, the testing, the deployment, and this can be from the fraud or into staging or something like that. But when we deploy the changes for, uh, to the network, we are using this single source of truth. We're using our main GitHub repository to make these. And then if there's any, ch any problems with that, we can monitor that and we can, we can use remediation tasks to roll that back or make the necessary changes to make the functionality work that we need to happen. And when we deploy those configurations, we use programmability and APIs and tooling to actually do that. And by using this, we can limit network uh, configurations across the board. And some of the things that we're gonna look at today here as well, are we're gonna explore those configuration management tooling that I spoke about in this slide right here. So, configuration management, a mechanism for maintaining the characteristics of a system. As we're used to as network engineers, there's a huge amount of hand-to-hand -hand combat, logging into several different devices, mailing it at once, opening multiple SSH terminals to your device, trying to troubleshoot where things have gone wrong. Coincidentally, I don't know if you've ever found this, but things never go wrong in the middle of the daytime. They always go wrong on a Friday night or on a Saturday on a weekend. And so we wanna move away from that. And so configuration management today is all about the tools. And if you're scaling your network, if you're growing your network, consistently plus scale equals success. One of the main things that I've found as a network engineer in my time 
and working in the security side of the business unit was knowing what software and versions were installed and knowing the desired state of all my devices across the board. This is kind of easy when you've got five or 10 devices to understand what images are on there, but when you start scaling out to 20 or 50 or 100 or even 1,000 devices, keeping track of the different types of versions and software that you're running becomes quite critical. Especially if you're firefighting a, a bug report or something like that and you need to quickly get all the information from your devices globally back from them to find out what versions you're running to see if the version you're running it should be changed or upgraded. This becomes a particular thing if you're keeping up with your software versions to, to deploy the latest technologies and keep abreast with all the security procedures that you should be following where the your security team might come to you and while you're midway through doing a deployment and updating all your software across the board and you need to know where that team is where they're upgrading you know they've updated certain regions but you want to be sure what they've upgraded across the board and so using automation to find the desired state in the software version installed becomes a lot more easier than again logging into these devices and issuing a show ver repeatedly and repeatedly until you've got your desired state then we move to things like system attributes like names, address and ownership, etc. You might not own all of the hardware in the network. You might be the network administration, but other devices and switches might be uh, managed and ran by other teams. For example, in the last team that I was in, the data center team had their own switches and these were called DSW switches. But they're really hard to identify when you're looking at them just through an IP address. Uh, uh, so you need to find some of the system attributes. And so by running again automation against all those devices, you can find out who the owners are and what their roles are within your business and within the network. And then we can look at feature specific configurations. Your core devices won't necessarily do what your edge devices do. And then you've got top of rack, end of rack access switches and all these different parts and components to your network and they all have specific configurations you might have different settings and different acls on your edge to what you have on your core devices and this becomes really important to knowing which configurations are going to live on which devices configuration management a mechanism for maintaining the characteristics of a system this really takes us into the benefits of configuration management and why we should actually look towards configuration management as a whole. Many times when you're building, say, a data center or something, or you're replacing or upgrading or scaling out one of your uh, networks or a segment of your network, you might have a data center team on hands. They might be the data center team that work with you, or they might be a set of remote hands which are attached to that data center. In situations where I've built complete greenfield sites, sometimes I've had as much as 30 pieces of hardware delivered and a data center team of four people assembling this for me. Often they hit the ground, they unpack their things, and they start racking and stacking things. It takes a huge volume of time for them to rack and stack all of this stuff. What they don't want to be doing is sat around twiddling their thumbs or waiting while the infrastructure and all these devices are then provisioned. Going in with uh, just text files and copy and pasting them in there and then doing all your validation, handing that over to the QA team and then handing the entire data center for other teams to test to make sure their services run is hugely time consuming. And when you've got men on the ground or you've got remote hands there waiting for con the confirmation and the green light to pack up and leave for the day, having to do this by hand is a very both very tiresome and very time consuming for everybody. So being able to quickly provision infrastructure via automation is really key here. And so the movement that you're looking to do is, is once you've got access to your data center, you can then provision that with your automation. The automation will run and the QA team then will use the same automation from the same source control that we mentioned before to actually QA the entire infrastructure and give it the green light so it's ready to go into production. No more snowflakes. This is, must be my really most favorite slide to do. Let's paint the picture. It's two in the morning, your on-call phone goes and there's an issue. You make your way to your laptop, 
you log into your device and it might be just a simple access list or static route that you need to configure. So you make that quick change. You confirm with the team that's called you that this has resolved their issue and they can carry on with their deployment or the problem that they were having due to access is, is now resolved. And you go back to bed. The next time when you get up in the morning, you head out the door, you head out your way to work, and then by the time you get to your work, you crack on with your day, and then sooner or later that day closes, the week finishes, the month ends, and then you look over your configurations and you think, hey, how did this static route get here? Or how did this ACL get there? It falls into the depths of your, into the back of your mind, and you can't remember how it's been there. Sometimes you don't want to cut that ACL or that static route off because you might be impacting a critical service. Now that thing has been in production for maybe a month's time, you really don't know what it's attached to and how much traffic is probably flowing through that. So then it becomes a difference of when you go back and you have to remember when you put that in. By running, the autom by running automation techniques and having everything backed up with the source control, you can then pretty much see where these snowflakes are and you can hopefully then remove them from all of your network configurations. And this really then aligns to what I just mentioned, version control. So if you have your version control, you know exactly when this was deployed and when the changes were made to the environment. And then you have a good record of when you know that your environment changed. So access might have stopped working or it might have started working and you can see that tied into all of your version control. Okay. Now we understand a little bit more about version control and source control, let's look about how we can actually ch achieve this with recipes, manifests and playbooks and all of the tools that are now available to us as network engineers. Here you'll see on the right hand side I've got Ansible, Puppet, Chef and SaltStack. These are the kind of most common open source foundation tools. And what do we mean by open source? Well, if you want to contribute to these, you can. This is the great part about open source foundation tools. If you, when you're working with these tools and you come across this great idea, share it, share it with, share it with the world because there's going to be somebody out there that's going to hit the same issue as you do. And so you can share this code with people and it can then be put into the latest releases. This can go true for bug fixes as well. You might come across a bug when using say Ansible or Puppet when running it against a good device. And then you can take a branch within the repo and do a, pull out, a PR request and submit your changes to them and say, I found this bug. All of these tools, Ansible, Puppet, Chef and SaltStack, all provide both automa automation and orchestration. They also provide item potent behavior, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And they give us facts and lots of facts. I don't know about you, but I absolutely love knowing facts about my network and what's going on. All of the tools on the right hand side use the uh, modules and libraries, which we're going to look at shortly. So here's the matrix of common info and terms. When I started building automation on a network, it seems like a great idea. I liked it as an idea. I could see the benefits, but I had to go to the business and say to the business, I'd like to start running automation against our network stack. And this is a problem that a lot of people do face is just getting that initial project off the ground. It's okay saying that you're going to remove some of the errors and things like that and all the commonalities that you actually find by using automation of a network. But what happens if someone says to you, why do you choose to use this tool as a network? Your mileage may vary to mine, as it would the next person's. So it's good to assess all the different tools that are available to see which one suits your needs the best. So starting on the right hand side, let's just look at SaltStack. The language that SaltStack is written in is Python and it uses agent-based minions. The centralized management is done by the, what's called the Salt Master. And what we create when building the, config, or building the automation for this is pillars and include. You can think of the pillar as a interface, uh, global values which distributes to the minions, and the include is for the same configurations. So if you've got multiple devices running the same uh, configuration, you can use the include to bundle those kind of all together, so you're not having to rewrite per device per device all the time. Kind of like grouping them together. Then we can look at Chef. This one is written in Ruby. 
The management node required is again agent based and the centralized is using a chef server and this uses recipes and cookbooks. Recipes are your predefined services and resources and the cookbooks are the attributes, file distributions and templates that you will use. Puppet, which is hugely popular, is Ruby based. This uses a traditional agent based and has a centralized management as the Puppet Master. There's been loads of times in my career where I've opened ACLs up for Puppet, but I didn't really get a chance to explore it and see all the cool stuff that it could actually do and help me with. Puppet uses manifests and modules. The manifest is the facts, files, and the templates, and the modules are code specific, uh, like directories and structures. And then finally we come around to Ansible. Ansible is written in Python, but the majority of the configuration work that you'll do, and we'll see this a little bit later, is in YAML. This is agentless, which is just a little bit different from the rest, which were agent based. The centralized management can be any computer. So this could be your computer or a shared server perhaps, or you can actually use the optional tower. And what you create here with Ansible is both playbooks and roles. And the playbooks are configurations, um, it's your administration, it's your deployments, and the roles are to do with the roles of the devices within your network. So you might have core and distribution and so forth. So why Ansible for the network? I started my network automation with Ansible because I found it the easiest thing to get up and running with. I didn't have much coding experience. And as I mentioned before, all of the files that I was creating to make this work in Ansible were written in YAML and YAML was really easy to get up and running with. So as I mentioned that Ansible is agentless. It's really popular within the network community with lots of examples. Sometimes there's no point in going out and rewriting the wheel for yourself when you can find an example which has got most of the bare bones and structure in there for you. And as you're gaining more experience, you'll be able to start writing up most of your automation yourself. But there's plenty of examples out of there and it's really popular in the community as well. Play lots of places to ask questions and interact and share your configurations if you get stuck. It's written in Python in the back end. It's simple to install and really easy to get started with. As I mentioned, when you're starting with your automation, you want to automate just a few things probably to start with and just get in a few simple examples just to start that little bit of the kickoff with the process to start the automation. It's really, really easy. But we'll explore some of the options as well. So configuration management with, exa uh, with an Ansible example. Here what we'll see is just a basic graphic overview of what happens when you run the Ansible playbook. The engineer deploys the Ansible playbook with the roles and modules. And you'll see just under there, there's a little section that says connection local. And what this means is it will execute the, all of the automation locally, and then it will send it to the devices using the API. And you can see that in step two, just in the bottom where I've written, Ansible executes the modules locally using API to interface with the devices. So instead of configuring the whole thing live on the switch, it builds the entire playbook and then pushes that directly out to the device itself. So this is where we get to do something really, really cool. We actually get to see an, this actually in action. And what you'll see on the right hand side is the topology which I've built. And here we have the core, which is uh, two XE routers. We've got distribution, which is Nexus switches, and we've got an access switch, which is again an, a, a Nexus switch. Let's assume that my data center team have already been on there. They've done an awesome job. They've cabled it up. They've given us management access to the devices, but that's all they've completed. There's no need for them to do any more. And now we see this is what we would like to see as our desired conf network configuration. We always should have in mind that the actual outcome of what we should be automating. Just because we can automate, it does not mean that we don't need to understand the architecture and the way the network should be deployed. We should always have the architecture in the back of our minds and always a plan of the architecture of what we need the network to look like before we do the automation. And so here on the right hand side, you'll see the, what the topology will look like. And on the left hand side, you'll see just some of the key items which I've highlighted. So we're gonna have layer three links between the core and the distribution layer. OSPF area zero routing configured between all four of those devices. 
We've got a layer two port channel and a trunk down to the access switch there. We've got some VLANs configured there. One, two, three, four VLANs configured for management, private, guest and security all on different subnets. And then we've got S SVIs at the distribution layer with HSRP configured. So the box that you'll see just on the right is exactly the same thing. I've SSH'd into the same box twice only because I want to run my automation from the left. But before we start, I wanted to show you the, um, the blank box before. So let's go back to where the data center team have just given us the management on the device. I'm just going to quickly jump into the core devices, which was the um, XE devices, which let's say they're facing your internet service provider, for example. So I'm actually using one of the sandboxes that we have for on DevNet. And this gives me the ability to test my configuration and this all runs in viral. And I'm just going to jump into this box now. So let's jump into a uh, core one. And I'll just do a very quick uh, show run and we'll see that there's pretty much nothing configured on the box. We've got our username, password, and then if we scoot down to the bottom, we have uh, the management IP address and all the rest of the interfaces are all blank. And then just the static route at the bottom, a quick show IP in brief. And you'll see that although the interfaces are up as it's already patched, there's no IP addresses on those. Let's hop out of this one and jump into the second one. A quick show run again. You see the host name, the passwords. There's our management IP address. The blank interfaces just with descriptions and then the static route and there we go there's nothing else on the boxes so if I'm just going to exit out of there just quickly and now I'm going to run the automation against those boxes uh, let's have a look That'll just take a little bit of time to run, so I'm just going to go back to the slides. We'll check in on that in a second. Let's talk about Ansible for a little bit while that's running. So the Ansible playbook runs roles against the different relevant uh, um, groups. And as I was mentioning before, this controls the configuration, the admin, and all of your deployments. And then we have the Ansible roles. The, the, these align to the network roles, which could be core, distribution, as edge is what we saw, and the inventory file. This lists the network devices, and here we can logically group for configurations. When was mentioning before, uh, I think we talked about it in SaltStack, where we was talking about the different groups and things like that. Here, this is where we can specify. So if you have two devices which are doing pretty much the same thing in the network and are gonna have the same configurations, like we saw that we were pushing like uh, four VLANs out to um, uh, three of the switches, we'd like all of those uh, VLANs on all of the switches. And we, so by having them all grouped together, it saves duplicating configuration. And then we have the variable files, which has device specific details or group for the general. And this is very similar to what I mentioned about the inventory file. But when you've got device specific details, you might have one single device and you may only have one edge router, for example, but then you might have two core switches. So you can specify them as like a, say a host, or you can specify them as a group. Okay. Let's look at that playbook then. So the playbook is designed for the workflow needed to configure the network. We have the link for the inventory devices and groups for the particular roles and the order of operation of dependencies and configuration. The importance of having the operation for dependency and configuration is that when you're configuring devices, you have to put things in in some form of hierarchical order for a lot of the device configurations. And when you're configuring uh, your automation, you should do it in the same way. Otherwise, you're going to get failures within the automation. So it has to be ordered within that logical way. Ansible roles per feature, as we mentioned, we can use reusable uh, role targets specific for network configuration. The two um, distribution switches that I was mentioning had VLANs, VPC, VPC trunks, port channel trunks, layer three interfaces, HSRP and OSPF. And the switches both had those. So when we're using this, we're pushing this out to these two devices. 
different groups will also get different roles. So if you have the group which is for core and you have the group which is for distribution, both the distribution and the core will both be separated and they'll get different roles within the uh, configuration files. And here we have the inventory. Here we're grouping the devices together as I mentioned above. If you see on the right hand side I've grouped this down into core, distribution and access. I only have one access so there's only one device within that, within that group. However, if I wanted to add another access switch into there, it would be really, really simple just to add another access list in there by adding another IP address. Incidentally, you don't have to use IP addresses. You can actually use DNS names instead. But you can do this as well for a tier. And this becomes particularly handy because when you're running your playbook, you might want to just run changes against your core or your distribution or your access. And you can see that they're listed down there into children. So the children represents another like a subsection and in that in that child folder would be the core where we see the two devices the same for the distribution here we have the configuration details which are maintained in the variable file this is separate from the automation and orchestration instructions and you'll see here that we have the vlan list and details layer 3 interfaces and the router id etc and this is host specific the router ID for one device is not going to be the same as the router ID for the other device. And this is where it becomes important to have this as a specific in, uh, um, details. And the same for the loopback IP address and the stuff for the interfaces. It wouldn't make much sense to configure the same IP address on two separate devices that we're connecting to each other, right? And then we can group them together. As I mentioned before, I wanted to push the management VLAN, the private VLAN and the guest VLAN out to three switches. And it's easy to group those all together and keep those group details nice and simple. And let's say, for example, I wanted to add another uh, VLAN into here. Let's say I wanted to put 104 or 105 in there for a new service that's coming on here. It's easy enough to put it into that group file. And then when it's pushed out to all the devices, all the devices which are in that group are going to get those VLANs. I'm just going to check in and see where our automation is. I see one has slightly failed. I'm just going to run that again. Hopefully that will be good. Okay. Oops, what's that saying? <clears throat> Hopefully the demo gods are with us today. This might just take one more run to actually get it to happen. Nope. Hmm. Let me just check that one there. <sighs> Having a rough day with demos today, Stuart. I am having a rough day with demos. The demo gods are not happy with me today, Hank, for some reason. <laughs> oh, we can reach the device. Flip back to the to the other window. I'm. Looks, yeah. It's actually trying to connect on the different ones, the different it pieces. It's it's a, on a different IP address. You're right. Your the inventory file for Ansible needs to be updated. So let's uh, we've got a little bit of time. We can do a, a quick troubleshoot on this one. If you open up the default inventory file, you can just yeah. fix those IP addresses. Um, right here. So let's go into ls inventory file. Yeah. yeah. So default inventory dot yeah. yaml. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Let me just take a look at that. Oops. Default. Yeah. Let's have a look. Let me just scoot that down a touch. So, all children, Ansible hosts. Yeah. Core ones, looks like they didn't get updated when the topology went. So just yeah. go in with Vi and just flip those IP addresses to 25 and I think 26 are what they're supposed 25 or 26. Now you get to see my fantastic Vim skills. <laughs> Solid <laughs> skills for every network engineer. Absolutely, absolutely. We love doing Vim. Uh, let's have a look. Oh, cool, there it is. Escape I. Yeah. No, oh, there it is. Uh, so 25. And then core 2 was 26. Yeah, before you save that, let's just double check. Flip over to the other window. Let's make yeah. sure we get the IPs right. So the core 1, 172.16.30.126 for core 2. And let me just side pull this down. I've got a little under the window there. And then 25, yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. So save that and let's try to run it again. Run I think we'll be good. 
Yeah. Thank you. Pair programming, having someone looking over your shoulder sometimes makes all the difference. It does. Let's just hope, let's see that run. There we go. Here we go. Okay. Let me go back to the slides. Okay. Let's go to the next slide. So I mentioned before idempotent network configurations and why all those things are idempotent or the tools that we were talking about, Puppet, Chef, Ansible, and SaltStack are idempotent. So what does idempotent really mean and how do we use it in a, in a kind of a, in a real world? Well, let me give you a great example of idempotency and this happened to me within the last year. I got into my office. I knew there was a network change going to run and as we, I was doing with Hank then we were pairing up and we paired up on a lot of stuff. I got into the office first and decided to, to run the, uh, the plan change and run, run the automation. So I ran the automation, all went successfully, I validated this and I walked away to get myself the well earned morning coffee. As I was away from my desk my colleague came in, um, he sat down, he knew he had the uh, the network change to make with the automation and he ran the same playbook. Now the interesting thing here is is that because of the item potency and the way that Ansible works is that nothing changed. Ansible recognizes that that configuration was already in place on those network devices and this is really cool because the automation ran and then it just came back with as you saw on my screen as okay no changes required. And this is fantastic, which means we can run these playbooks at any time to, configure, to verify our configuration is still in the same state as what is desired. This means that if you get up and you're troubleshooting your network and you can't see any source controls being changed, you could actually run your Ansible code and actually see if anything's changed just by running that. And then we can add interfaces, VLANs on networks, as I was talking a little bit about before, just by updating the variable files and rerunning the playbook again. And then we can do that, as I mentioned as well, by do, limiting it to things like the core distribution and access if we didn't want to push out the entire playbook. Another great example of this is that the data center, time, data center team go to the site, they add a new access switch, and then we just add it back into the inventory file and we just rerun the playbook again. And because this is an access switch, we already know what to do with it and we already know the configurations that should be there. And so the basic rule of thumb here is only update the playbooks or roles when the features are added or changed. So before I go to the summary, let's go back to our, our network and see if this is done. Let's just run that one more time. So while we're doing that, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna jump into one of the other boxes here and I'm just gonna check some of the configurations on the other box. So I'm gonna jump into, let's have a look. I'm gonna jump into, first let me go into the access. Let's sage into access one. Here we go. Okay, so let's just see if the VLANs are there to start with. Show VLAN brief. Scoot down the bottom, and there we go. We've got the management VLAN, private VLAN, the guest one, and the security one as well. That's pretty good. Okay, show IP in brief. And we just got the loop back there. Let's just look for show uh, interface uh, port channel. And let's see, I believe the port channel is 11. There we go, uh, there we go. And we can see we've got the port channel up there. And then let's just take a look, quick look at show run interface. I'll just pipe that down a little bit more actually, make that a little bit more granular. I love the range command on Nexus switch, it's one of my favorite commands. And there you can see that we've got both of our, our ports and they're put into the chunking mode. I'm going to flip back over here now to show that uh, item potency power and there what we see is we've got four changes that have been made. So the things that errored out first were just the four there. None of them have failed and all the devices were reachable which is good. Okay so let's take a look at those core devices. Now, I was on those before so they should still be in my buffer. Now let's SSH back into those again. Here we go. So show IP in brief. And now all our interfaces have got IP addresses on them. Hey, that's pretty good. Show run. Uh, just section work on here. And there we go. 
we've got OSPF all configured in there for all of our network addresses in there which is really cool and let's just do a quick show run. Uh, OSPF. Yep, I think that's about it for that one. Let me just jump out of there and go into the second one. There you go. Password. That's just hanging over so slightly. There we go. So show IP in brief. There we go, we see all interfaces have got IP addresses on them now, which is what we want. Show run section router. We see OSPF again, which is fantastic. And we can run OSPF commands on here. So show uh, IP OSPF. And what do we want to see? We'd like to see the interfaces. There we go. We can see all our interfaces there, which are running OSPF. Fantastic. Let's jump out of there should have these just still in our buffer here so I'm just going to SSH directly into the distribution switches which are again the Nexus 9Ks and some of the features that we configured on here were VPC so let's just see those that's great and then HSRP so we've got all of HSRP configured and let's take a look and see the um, interfaces Cool. And we can take a look at the um, OSPF configuration. OSPF's all there. And then finally, let's just take a quick look at the port channels. Uh, show interface port channel summary. Oops. What uh, No, sorry. Show interface uh, port channel uh, 11. There we go. So there's our port channels. Cool. Let's just hop back over to uh, distribution 2 and we'll just take a look at that one just to make sure that that one's been configured also. Uh, show run VPC. Our VPC configuration is there. Show run OSPF. SPF configurations there. Show IP in brief, and then we can see all of our interfaces are there, including our SVIs as well. And recall that when we were talking a little bit earlier about hierarchical order and the way that we implement things across our network, well, as you know, on the Nexus devices, you have to enable a lot of the features. Oops. Include feature. So here you'll see some of the features that we had to enable. And if we hadn't enabled these first, then things like OSPF and Interface VLAN, HSRP, LAPC and MVPC right at the bottom there wouldn't have been able to be implemented on the devices. It's simply the, the boxes would have, would have um, stopped from that from happening. So you have to enable those devices. So in the, in the running order and the things that we put into the devices, these are the things that we implement first to actually make these things possible to, on, the, um, on the device itself. So this is really cool. And before we close out uh, and go away from the demo, I want to move over and show you now the um, actual actual code that's here. And we can do this. And I'm using I'm using Atom um, to view my code. And here I've just brought up my my Atom on the screen. And this is all of the code that we're running today, just in the single directory. And so first of all, I'm going to look into roles. I'm going to, I'm going to scoot down into uh, network VPC. And then I'm going to look at the NX API. And here you'll see when we was talking about enabling the features, that these are the features that I was enabling here. Um, so we're looking at the VPC, LAPC, uh, sorry, LACP, and then we configure the VPC here. And we've got the things that we need to configure our, um, our VPC. So we've got the VPC domain, the source IP address, the destination IP address, and the VOF that it needs to be in here. And then the rest of the configuration for this as well. So here we have the port channel and the port channel members of the interfaces that we need to be in here. And then scooting on down, we've got the uh, in uh, information here for the trunks where we have the, uh, the port channel ID. And then right at the bottom there, you can see we've got the enable the VPC peer link that needs to come up as well. 
Looking a little further up into the configuration, if we go up into uh, group vars and then we can look at, let's take a look at the distribution one. And this here you see it's written out in, in, in YAML. And you'll see Ansible Network OS, and we're specifying here that we've got uh, Nexus and XOS. And here we're configuring the HSRP. So we've got VLAN 100, we've got the group for that, the IP, and the and the VIP IP address for that. Um, and then moving down, we've got 101, 102, and 103 respectively. A little bit further down here in the YAML file, we've got everything that we need for OSPF. So you can see here that when we looked on the distribution switch on the distribution switches, you saw that we had uh, Ethernet 1 slash 5 and 1 1 slash 6, and we've got the respective SVIs VLANs within um, within the OSPF process ID as well. So here we've got 100, 101, 102, and then if we go down a little bit further, you can then see the um, port channels here, which was going towards the access layer of the switch. So reading the YAML file as mentioned before is actually really easy to do. You don't have to really have a great deal of coding experience to read this because it looks similar to the layout that we're familiar with when running our, our network configuration and devices. So summary, what did we talk about? We talked about what is infrastructure's code and code management. And we looked at the benefits as well of code management and how the benefits can save you a great deal of time when configuring your devices, whether this be new builds or you're just adding devices within your network and how everything can now be in source control and we can all start working from this single source of truth. We looked at the, man, uh, the recipes, the manifests and, and the playbooks in great detail and we looked into the Ansible playbooks and how these are constructed with the various YAML files and then how we deployed that. And then we looked at the configuration management with Ansible, running this across our entire network stack just in one go to actually bring up our, our, our whole network. For more information here, we've got the webinar resource list and you can go and see all of the docs that we've talked about today at developer.cisco.com forward slash netdevops. You can go and do all of these labs for yourself here in our learning labs. We have the laptop set up if you want to run this on your own environment, or you can just do what I do and just jump into the dev box, which we provide for most of our learning labs, where you can just install everything for yourself. We have a really, really cool lab of instruction to Ansible, and then we have the instruction to Ansible from iOS XE configuration management as well. Um, which is another really, really great one to get looking at. The next two links down are the sandboxes. These come in two flavors. We have the always on sandbox and then we have the reserve based sandbox. You can take whichever one you want, just log into your DevNet account and, and get the credentials to log into there. With the reserve one, you'll get all the information sent to you as soon as you reserve your sandbox. And as always, all of the code samples that we've talked about today in this demo and everything that we show you across DevNet is in our GitHub repo. So my challenge for you today after watching this and hopefully you've been inspired is to create your own Ansible playbooks and cons configure um, some of the features that we need in the network today that we're using. If you're new at using this, I would suggest starting off with some of the simple things like SNNTP, NTP, TACAS and VLANs and routing. Once you've built that skill set up a little bit further, you can move on to some of the more advanced configurations. But what I'd really like you to do is to make your example in a GitHub repo and then up upload it to Cisco Code Exchange where the link is on the file there. And you can share that with the community. If you're looking for more information about NetDevOps and all the sessions that we're doing here, please head over to developer.cisco.com forward slash NetDevOps and then NetDevOps forward slash live where you can find out all the information of all the upcoming courses and um, information that we've got out for the Web uh, WebEx Live webinars. We're blogging this constantly over, over at NetDevOps as well. And the really great place to get started is the Network Programming uh, Basic um, video course, which will walk you through everything that we both talked about today. And there's a lot of learning to be had. If you've got any more questions, please reach out to us. You can reach out to us on our Twitter feed at Cisco DevNet, our Facebook page. And as I said, all of the uh, code that we've talked about is on the repo where you can pull all those down and you can interact with us on there if you've got any problems as well. If you wanted to reach out to me directly, all of my contact details are on the left hand side. Feel free to check out my tweets, which I tweet very regularly about different uh, network automation things. And you can follow along with some of my code examples there at my GitHub page. All right, thanks so much, Stuart. Great session as always. Thanks everybody for joining us tonight on our NetDevOps Live technical talk covering DevOps style configuration tools in the open source community. Be sure to join our follow-up uh, 
sessions on all sorts of topics in the Knit DevOps area, and we'll see you in our next one. Thanks. Mm -hmm.